Glass mosaics were pounded into dust. Books were ripped apart. Wooden panel paintings chopped into pieces. And the blood of the holy images, so it was said, soaked the clothing of the iconoclasts. It wasn't only little things either. The monuments of the city were actually covered in images. This, for example, was part of a great milestone that stood at the centre of the city. The emperor decreed that the sacred image of the Virgin that it contained should be scraped away and a picture of his favourite charioteer put up in its place. What on earth was going on? Once more, signs and symbols tell the story. About the year 750, that same emperor who so hated holy images restored this fine old church, St. Irene's in Constantinople. The plain cross is the measure of the man, the pious emperor Constantine V, a single-minded soldier. Like other emperors and generals of the time, Constantine V believed these sacred pictures were evil in the sight of God. The church contains no other images. We move in a dangerous and mysterious age. Part of the dark mystery of iconoclasm was actually sold a few years ago in the Vatican Library by the study of this old book. Now this book well, it was clearly more than a thousand years old, but the text in it was twice as old as that and more. This is called Ptolemy's Handy Tables, and it was written in ancient Alexandria and Egypt, and it describes all the passages of the stars and the sun and the moon through the sky. What was so remarkable about this copy of it was not simply its beauty, but also the fact that it had been written at the height of iconoclasm, right at that burning beginning when every image in the churches were being destroyed. Now the key of this book, and the central image of it, is this beautiful plate in the front. And it shows you, it's a sort of a diagram from the most ancient world of astrology. There's the zodiac signs around the edge, all those wonderful old signs all added together to make a sort of cosmos. And in the middle, this iconoclast artist has actually painted Apollo, the sun god. This is the ancient Greek world. It revolves around the sun. And there's Apollo in his chariot sailing through the sky. Isn't that extraordinary? These pious emperors who think so deeply and so hard about Christianity put Apollo in his chariot at the center of the universe. Why didn't they've done that? The truth is, of course, this man is interested in these old pagan values. He's thinking of luck. Charioteers, his favourite charioteers, ran races and won them in the centre of Constantinople. The charioteers brought luck and victory to his city and that's what these iconoclasts wanted. They wanted a pure Christianity, but they wanted that most ancient virtue, luck. In the great spasm of iconoclasm that passed through Byzantium in the 700s, the monasteries and nunneries along this lonely coastline to the south of Constantinople sheltered both the artists and the holy images. The battle for the icons ebbed and flowed throughout Byzantium like a summer storm. But you know, those pictures never really left the people. They were too much beloved. The monks really fought for them. The monks of the great imperial monasteries of Constantinople, the monks that lived here in this idyllic land along the coast of Marmara, they died for those pictures. There were icons too, even in the royal palace. The ordinary people liked them. The people in the royal family liked them. Constantine V's own son was married to a girl from Athens called Irene, who kept icons in the palace. Now, Irene was an interesting lady. She wanted the icons back. And when her son finally became emperor in his own right, she took him back to the room where he'd been born, a room of shining porphyry, and had him blinded and restored the pictures. That terrible story of Irene wasn't the end of the iconoclasm. Fifty years later, 
they were still torturing people who liked pictures. A painter called Lazarus had his hands forced down on sheets of red hot iron to stop him painting and still he got a paintbrush in his crippled hand and painted a new image of the Hellgate Christ on the gate of the Imperial Palace and that as the people of the city knew was the restoration of the pictures. In the year 867, on the 29th of March, the Patriarch of Constantinople, one Photius, dedicated the first pictorial mosaic in the Church of St. Sophia, the great cathedral of Byzantium. Beside it, in mosaic, was a single sentence these images that the heretics cast down have been set up again by pious emperors. The iconoclasts had lost the century-old debate. Even in her image, Photius tells us, the Virgin graces and delights. She strengthens and she comforts us. Once again, the holy pictures filled Byzantium with their unearthly presence. In Saint Sophia, images of Christ were placed up in the dome and here, above the church's central door, where only the emperor could enter. Not the favorite western image, the mortal Christ impaled in time upon a cross, but the old familiar figure from the palace gate, Christ of all time and of all places, Christ Lord of the cosmos. Before this ancient image, penitent emperors now prostrate themselves in awe. Not long ago, there was a better ending to this story. Here, in the ancient walled city of Nicaea, close to Constantinople. In the first years of Byzantium, the Christian creed had been written in this pretty little city and approved here too by the first council of the church. Over the following centuries, Nicaea had filled with little churches. One of them, a miniature Saint Sophia, decorated with mosaics that celebrated the return of icons after the iconoclasm. Now though, you can only see the glittering scenes in old photographs. The triumphant angels, the exquisite Madonna drawn over the shadow of the iconoclast's plain cross. All of this was blown away in the Greek and Turkish wars of 1922. And each side still blames the other. How is it that people can show such tremendous ferocity to such quiet beauty, such passive images? Well, these pictures were actually intended to actually take part of the identity of the Virgin, part of the eternal cosmic identity of the Virgin. Something was there at the beginning of time and there at the end of time, and you had it in your church. As every little icon, every little picture throughout the empire refracted these bits of holiness throughout the empire. The emperors didn't want that. They wanted to gather all that dispersed holiness around their own person in the city, along with the sacred relics inside their palace, just as they collected the taxes. So they wanted that power to themselves. But the Byzantines came from one of the most ancient cultures of the Middle East. The people wanted their images. So the triumph of the pictures, you might say, is really a compromise. The emperor gets his sacredness, his divine power, and his taxes in Byzantium. And the people get their pictures. The compromise 
is the most indelible aspect of the Byzantine identity. This is a picture of a procession carrying an icon, and it was made six centuries ago, in the last years of Byzantium. It gives a precious glimpse of Constantinople's most famous image of the Virgin Mary, painted, it was believed, from the life by St. Luke himself. Underneath, for some of those who centuries before had fought iconoclasm and found their way to paradise. Saint Theodosia, the Virgin Martyr, the abbots of the monasteries, the artists, they hold the pictures that they died for. Pictures painted with such passion and precision, such blazing colour, such quiet power, They say that on the last night of Byzantium, on the evening of Monday, the 28th of May, in 1453, just hours before Constantinople fell to the armies of the Turks, that the Virgin came down into her city for the last time and took her picture back to heaven. <laughs> <laughs> 